Avatar The Last Airbender is one of the greatest shows of all time. Not one of the best animated shows ever, but the best shows ever. IMBD rates it number 12 in the greatest shows of all time, the highest animated show on the list. The show has recently seen a sort of renaissance after being added to Netflix. It's been introduced to a whole new generation, becoming the longest running show on the top 10 list of Netflix, staying at number one for a few weeks. Everything about it, from the characters to the world building, create a truly beautiful story. Unlike many shows aimed towards children, Avatar didn't shy away from more mature topics that made people think. The show deals with genocide, the rise of a fascist regime and how it impacts society, and the most obvious, war and its effects on people. The story is so expertly told that these mature topics and themes are interwoven into this fantasy world and don't seem artificial at all. One of the most impressive aspects of the show to me is the visuals. The use of color helps bring the show to new heights and really emphasize aspects of the setting and the characters' emotions. I don't want to get too much into characters and spoilers, but the character Zuko is one of the most well-written characters ever. Zuko starts out a hot-headed teen whose sole purpose in life is to restore his honor by completing an impossible task. Throughout the series, his redemption arc unfolds and though he stumbles along the way, he faces a crossroads of destiny and chooses to become good. At the end of the series, Zuko had become a wise young adult, realizing that honor isn't something that's given to you, it's something you earn for yourself through virtuous actions. I, like many people, first watched Avatar live when it first came out. I remember becoming obsessed with the story and the characters, and I think like many people that Avatar was one of the most influential shows in becoming the person I am today. It's so well done and means so much to so many people that it's no surprise that it stood the test of time, still being talked about 15 years later. For many people, it gave their race the representation that Hollywood has forgotten about for so long. Inuit people had the characters such as Katara and Sokka, which were main characters to look up to, something rarely seen. Most of the characters in the show are Asian, another race rarely seen in major Hollywood productions. Asian and Inuit kids so rarely have role models to look up to in Hollywood, and Avatar gave them just that. The characters themselves transcend race though, as anyone can see themselves in at least one character. I think one reason that the show has aged so well is that the characters are just so relatable. The show accurately displays real life problems in a fantasy way. Characters second guess themselves, and they wonder if they're not good enough. Characters deal with anxiety, family drama, hell, it even displays the awkwardness of falling in love. All humans deal with these things, and to see them explored in the series and seeing that everything's okay in the end is a very powerful thing for people. This show has helped so many people through so much and taught them to always be the best version of yourself you can be. I like to end with quoting Uncle Iroh. You can't always see the light at the end of the tunnel, but if you just keep moving, you will come to a better place. Of all the characters in the show, one sticks out like a boiling pot of tea. The character Iroh. Iroh is the mentor to Zuko and Mr. Rogers of the series. Iroh was once a prosperous war general and heir to the throne, but threw that all away after the passing of his son. Iroh then went on a journey to find himself and came out a wise and better man. Iroh lets the characters know that all will be okay in the end, and if you choose to be the best version of yourself, you can be. In a way, Iroh was all of our uncles, and in a sense, he was our generation's Mr. Rogers. He preached kindness and always to keep a level head in moments of distress. I know in life I think about what Iroh would do, and I'm sure I'm not alone. Iroh is such a big part of so many people's lives, it's hard to overlook the character. Iroh was originally voiced by Mako Iwamatsu, who unfortunately passed away after the second season. The actor Greg Baldwin took over the mantle of Iroh in season 3, and a bit in season 2. An almost lifelong fan of Avatar, I was ecstatic when Greg followed me on Twitter. After talking with him for a bit, I mentioned we should get together to talk about the show, a thought which he happily agreed. Before we get into the interview, I'd like to mention two things. Firstly, a big thank you to Greg for taking the time to talk and being so kind. Secondly, I apologize for being so mad and frozen. I was freaking out the entire time and trying not to show it. Without further ado, here's Greg Baldwin and I having a one-on-one. -on -one. And now, Charlie Lee presents a one-on-one -on -one with the extraordinary Greg Baldwin. Okay, so first off, I'd just like to introduce myself. 
my name is Charlie Lay. I'm a high school student. Um, Hello, Charlie. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. Um, I've been an Avatar fan my whole life. Um, I admire your work so much. Just wanted to let you know. Um, and then let's just get right into it. Would you like to introduce yourself to the viewers? Well, I'm Greg Baldwin. Uh, I've been a voice actor for many years, actor for even more years than that. Uh, I am primarily known for uh, taking over uh, the roles that Mako Arimatsu uh, made famous. So I am the Mako man, the Mak Mako. <laughs> so how did you originally get into voice acting then? Well, I mean, I, I always, from the time I was a little kid, I could always do accents and things, mainly by listening to my parents' Broadway cast albums, which is actually how I discovered Mako. Uh, but man, I, you know, I wanted to be an actor, moved here with my wife, not here, I'm not here, I'm not in LA anymore. Uh, moved to, <laughs> no, it's been a while. Uh, moved to LA in 1987 from Houston uh, and got very, very lucky there. I was able to book some McDonald's commercial, get my SAG card. Uh, but then we had two kids in rapid succession, Irish twins they're called, uh, 11 months apart. So I didn't do much uh, acting at all for probably a good 10 years after that. Gotcha. Then, you know, I'd always loved the theater. The kids were old enough. I really got the urge to go back and do some theater again. There was a theater in Hollywood called the Actors Co-op that I started working at. And I did a play called Bullshot Crummond, in which I played Count Otto von Bruno, the second most dangerous man in Europe. And uh, I had a whole bunch of characters. Indeed, there was one, there was one scene where I literally did a scene with myself. I would go behind a curtain and put on a hat and be a different character. And the uh, the director said, you know, Greg, you, you, you're pretty good with this voice thing. Uh, a friend of mine, Sue Blue, teaches uh, voice acting for animation and also was a casting director. So, you know, it might be a good idea if you went and uh, took, took from her, which I did. Yeah. And fortunately, she liked me enough to literally make a phone call to my, to, and procure me an agent. Yeah. So I was finally able, I had my SAG card, I had a voiceover agent in Los Angeles. I was off and running. It took me a while from that point. Uh, you know, I, I booked small gigs, some video games, and, and it really wasn't until Avatar The Last Airbender that I really, you know, started taking off. So that's sort of, a, a, in a circular route, that's sort of how I ended up, you know, here in this, uh, my cool little recording booth in Albuquerque, New Mexico is kind of awesome. It's kind yeah. of cool. So you do acting and voice acting, which which do you prefer then? Oh, you know what? My, my first love is the theater. I love the theater. There won't be any theater for a while though, you know, okay. that's not coming back. Uh, I, I like, I've done, I've done some uh, on camera work. I was notably in uh, Hail Caesar, which is a Coen Brothers movie. I've got a week on that. And you know, it's great fun. I'm also pragmatic, you know, I mean, the thing is, on camera work, unlike theater work, that's its own thing, but on camera work, you show up at ungodly hour at five o'clock in the morning, you know, you the hours can sometimes be, you know, 15 hours a day, a lot of which is literally you just sitting on your butt waiting for the shot. And you make the same amount of money for going into a recording booth for an hour and recording an, an animated show for 20 minutes. So I, I always seem to me that, you know what, in the long run, I, I kind of like doing this thing that doesn't take as much time, you know? Yeah. And the word for that, I think, is lazy. Lazy would be would be the word for that. I'm, I'm quite yeah. lazy. Very lazy. Well, I know voice acting's been in the news lately. It's been a relevant topic because um, actors and actresses feel that people of color and animation should be playing should be played by people of people of color. Do you agree with that? What is your stance on that? Well, I'm, I'm probably not the one to be asking about <laughs> that. Uh, when you take into account my particular situation. Yeah, of course, taking. Uh, I, I, you know what? I, 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 I will tell. I will tell you this. When I go, uh, dovetailing from your previous question, when I go to an on-camera audition. You know, generally it's going to be at a casting director's office and they're going to be casting more than one thing. All I need to do when I walk into that room is look for the fat old white guys. And I know that that's where I'm going. That's where I belong. That's where I'm supposed to be. It's the only thing that I'm going to be cast as. 
I'd like to be careful here because the beauty yeah. of voice acting is you're not constrained by your physical appearance, you know? And I, 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 that's one of the things I love the most about it is I literally don't have to play. I mean, you know what? I'll be cast as a banker. No, maybe a, a congressman. I don't know. There's things that I would be cast as very, very limited. Whereas I get to be Haku and, and Iroh and I get to be a Jedi. And, you know, I'm not even human, the Jedi. Yeah. I, I think to me that is, that is the beauty of voice acting is that we are not constrained by our physical appearance. That being said, I, I certainly understand both sides of the issue, probably me more than, more than some, again, because of my very uh, uh, interesting situation myself. That was very uh, well said. I like that a lot. I have, I have no doubt that there were conversations going on about this at Nickelodeon when they were considering hiring me back in uh, probably, I think it was 2006, 2007. Uh, I, 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 I guarantee you they were having those conversations. And I think at the end of the day, and I think, you know, they, they, they could have gone with someone that was the, the appropriate ethnicity for the role of Iroh. Although technically Iroh's from the Fire Nation, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah. They, they could have gone. But I think at the end of the day, the fans, we'll just say George Takai, it will just say that, a, a really high profile Asian actor. They could, I'm sure they were thinking about it and that was certainly a route to go. And I think in my particular case, I think it was better to have, even with my imperfect impersonation of Mako, it, it was good to have as smooth a transition as possible and not quite as jarring. Uh, so I, you know, I'm, I'm thankful that Nickelodeon made that call. Uh, again, I'm sure they had those conversations. So then again, you took over for Mako. Um, were you known for being a mock Mako before the show or did this come afterwards? Not at all. I came, I came about it and I, I love it because it, it goes to show you how you never, it's like that I wrote, it's like how you, you never know how things are going to turn out. 17 years old in Texas, uh, in high school, I loved musical theater. I still love musical theater, you know. Uh, and I think for my birthday, maybe Christmas, I forget, my parents gave me uh, an album, a vinyl album of a Stephen Sondheim show called Pacific Overtures. Uh, it was about the opening up of Japan by Commodore Perry in the 1850s. An amazing musical, Sondheim's best musical. I fell in love with this musical because they were doing things. They were dealing with geopolitical themes and as opposed to just boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl. They were doing things in, in musical theater that predated Sweeney Todd in many ways. It, it did actually predate Sweeney Todd. Things that I, I couldn't imagine they were doing and I was very struck by the lead actor. And I would sing along with this album day after day after day. I could sing it all for you right now. The lead actor's name was of course, Mako Uematsu. Oh. So, you know, you flash forward to 2006, when he sadly passed away. And I, I was just lucky. I had actually literally been doing an impression of the man for 30 years at that point. And that's, that's how I ended up in Marco's roles. I, I never met him. Uh, I hope to meet him someday, but you know, not, not too soon, you know, preferably. Uh, I think, I think I hope he would appreciate what I what I've done. The weird thing is, not only was I stepping into the shoes of, of uh, these iconic characters, Iroh and Aku, but it was also the iconic actor to voice those two characters. Yeah. So it 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 weighed. It still weighs heavily on me, as a matter of fact. But I mean, I think I've I've told the story before, and I I think. All I can say in terms of how I've handled Mako's mantle, uh, it was a Samurai Jack record at Cartoon Network. I, uh, I signed in, you know, at the, the guard at the front, and I noticed just ahead of my signature, someone had signed in as Mako. And I thought, well, uh, that's, a, that's a sick joke, you know. But I go back to the green room, I'm sitting there, Gendy Tartakovsky, the, the creator of Samurai Jack, comes up to me and says, hey, Greg, you know, come here, I want you to meet, I want you to meet these people. You know, lovely, lovely woman with a teenage son. And Gendy says, you know, this is this is Mako's daughter and Mako's grandson, also named Mako. And I'm going, well, there's a great, you know, Gendy, I wish maybe you would have told me, you know, beforehand. Because, you know, it, it's 
one thing just to voice or to attempt an impression of an iconic actor it is another thing entirely to an attempt an impression of someone's father who is no longer on this plane of existence mm -hmm. so you know i was like oh man i'm sweating bullets there i don't know go in and we start to record fortunately i can't see where they're sitting i'm at an angle but phil lamar can and Phil uh, told me later that the minute I started speaking, uh, Mako's daughter just looks up, closes her eyes, and looks up at the, uh, the ceiling. And when I came out of the recording session, she was there with tears in her eyes, came up and gave me a hug and said, thank you so much. It, it was like he was in the room with me again. Mm -hmm. And for me, in terms of my professional career or my existence simply as as a human that was one of the greatest things uh, days of my life you know to be to have been able to give her that as imperfect as my impression might be i i i i just keep thinking to myself but i still get a, a little emotional when i think about it I, what i wouldn't give to hear even an imperfect impression of my own father's voice again you know yeah. so i think you know, I, I, I think I think I've done all right in, in terms of, of honoring him, and he deserves to be honored. Uh, and it always comes up, and it's the weirdest thing. It is weird that an old white, you know, fat guy took over Mako's roles, and I, I think that someday when I do meet him, we'll probably have a good laugh over it because it is, it's funny. It's funny. I I always say he hope I hopefully he will say one of two things to me when, when we meet and, and probably both he will say uh first of all greg it is an honor to meet you thank you for honoring my life and my legacy and the second thing he's going to say is are oh, you kidding me they went with a white guy that's insane so you know probably a little bit of both yeah so were you familiar with the show and the character iroh before you auditioned or yes i was as a matter of fact uh Ironically, when the show first came out, when they were casting the show, I did send in, and I remember seeing it, I was sending in an audition for Uncle Ira. Because uh, I thought, oh, this is well written, I wonder what this is. And I wasn't surprised at all when I finally watched the show with my kids who were, I think my kids were about 10, 12 years old, I guess, when it came on. Uh, so I wasn't surprised at all that it was Mako playing the role because I think when I auditioned for it, I thought, Marco should be playing as well, and indeed he was. So yes, I did. In the, the same situation in Samurai Jack, as I had the luxury of watching both of those shows as a fan, just as a regular fan, it never dreaming in my wildest imagination that I would actually someday uh, get, get to be a part of it. You know. So then, when you when did you audition for the role after Marco was doing it? And I yes, yeah, yes, I did. I did indeed. Then it came out again, and I remembered this because I was actually being laid off by Disney the first time. But that's another. Uh, I auditioned for the role, and I remember it was a very bad day because I just found out that I was getting laid off. And uh, I remember wondering, well, I wonder why I'm reading Iroh. Uh, you know, Mako plays Iroh, and I thought, well, you know, sometimes they're doing video games or something, and the, the, the star actor doesn't want to do it, so they look for voice matches, and that's what I kind of figured it was. And then it was the day we went to the, uh, my son and I used to get on the San Diego uh, Comic-Con, just to, like fans, just to go and enjoy it. Yeah. And that's when the news broke that Mako had passed away, and that's when I went, oh, oh, that's, that's awful. Now I understand why they're sending me the sides. So a couple of, I mean, a week or so passed and my agent called and said, okay, good news, you are their first pick. Uh, they'd like to see you with Nickelodeon. And I think that was my first of, when you count them all, I think I auditioned like four times for Iro. Gotcha. Bit by bit. The first time would have been just, you know, at home with my microphone sending in the audition. The last audition was with the creators of the show, with the uh, executives from Nickelodeon. Everybody crammed in there, you know, talking about me which is uh, also nerve wracking. They actually said it, Andrea Romano, the, the voice director uh, said, okay, we're gonna turn off their microphones now, Greg said, we can, you know, we all need to talk about you. And it was funny to actually watch them all very animatedly talk about me, you know, in the booth. And I'm of course just going, oh, please, I want this job so bad. I please want this, please, please choose me. 
And then like such things happen, they didn't call for another probably three weeks. And I thought, well, that's it. Didn't get it, you know. And then my agent called. And that was a good day. We went to Disneyland the next day. Because that's what you do when you get cast as Iroh. You go to Disneyland. Yeah. So then you get the role, were you instantly just thrust into it? Or did you have time to... Uh, no, fairly quickly I went in and, uh, and recorded the, uh, the very first episode, which was also very nerve wracking because you know it's a big part it's a it's a huge franchise and, and to a lesser extent as with Mako's daughter I'm walking into a room full of people that worked with him he was their you know partner yeah. were, you know their friend they they knew the man and uh, you know so there's a lot of I'm sure it's like who the hell the hell is this guy you know this guy thinks he can do Mako uh so yes, it was it was very nerve wracking. To be honest with you, even today, uh, if, if doing Iro and doing Aku, it's always in the back of my head. You know, usually in voice acting, you you simply you're given a script, and those those are the tools that you have to create the character. The writer has created this character for you. The voice director can guide you, uh, but you really it, it's the words and the character and how does this character sound. The difference in this situation is not only do I have to worry about am I honoring the writer's words, am I honoring this character as it's written, but am I honoring the actor that originally played this character? And I tell you, I uh, I think it's in uh, Tales, uh, Tales of Ba Sing Se yeah. is the very first time you hear my voice. For, some, for whatever reason, Maka was obviously not available to do the pickup, and it's the same with the, uh, the Earth bending kids and they break a window and usually if the whole episode is just me it's enough like mako that it doesn't jump out at you but man in that in that episode because it's me doing the voice in one scene but the next scene it pops back over and it's mako doing the voice and it's like you can tell from a mile away that that ain't mako doing that scene so then I guess this sort of relates to that, the environment of the set. Were you in the room with the other voice actors or did you record yours alone? Usually on Avatar and the same with Samurai Jack, usually they tried to get as many actors together as possible. Gotcha. In fact, I think for the first episode of uh, Avatar, there were so many of us there that Dante was in a little side, uh, <laughs> or was, was it me? Somebody was in a little side booth over there. And, I, and Dante, I remember, talks about how it totally freaked him out because it's like, oh my God, it's just like freaking me out, man. This is spooky. <laughs> you know? Uh, but usually, not, you know, sometimes, you know, you can't get the actors together. I think uh, on Samurai Jack, I recorded my scene with Tom Kenny uh, by himself because Tom Kenny is Tom Kenny and obviously has lots of, lots of things going on. Usually, though, they try to get as many as they possibly can. And you, and you read it through, you know, linearly. Linearly, is that even a word? In a linear fashion. Yeah. You know, unlike movie making, you know, where you might shoot the end and then you shoot the middle. It's more theatrical. You go from the beginning to the end. And because she was an actor, you, you can sort of work your way through that a little easier, I think. So obviously the show has culturally stood the test of time. But did you guys realize how big it was going to be when you were recording and when it was airing? I mean, I knew that it was a very popular show when I stepped into the show. I, I knew that already. I didn't really know the impact of it until I started going to cons. And I started meeting fans and the fans would come up to me. Many, I mean, some of them, I, I literally, and I, I'm not even lying here, I, I literally can do the voice and a, a grown man will cry. To hear that voice the fans would come up and say oh i was feeling bad in my life or this happened then iro said this and it helped me through and i, I hear that so many times iro's advice or his wisdom helped me through and i yeah I, I, that's when i realized wow this is something uh, this is something different and then uh you know i do the, i do the cameos which are like you know happy birthday you know and you know yeah, i would do a couple of them a week you know then what was interesting is once the uh, once we unfortunately the pandemic began, I started getting more, mostly just from people wanting to be told that it was okay, wanting to hear from Iro that everything's fine. But then, man, it was like a week after Netflix picked up Avatar, 
Yeah. I look at my phone, it's like, oh my God, I don't even know if I can fill all these orders in a week. This is a lot. And that's when uh, I like, holy moly, this is becoming a Star Wars type level. You know? Yeah. And, uh, and in fact, I, not, I at some point, I imagine they will literally have avatar cons when we have cons again. Yeah. Then when we when we have theater and cons and restaurants. And... I'm actually a big fan of cons. I've been to many in the past in Chicago. That's where I'm from. Um, but I just love them so much. But again, because of the pandemic. <laughs> Dude, oh, I miss them. I miss talking to fans and I miss, you know, there is something, and I, I think it's why I love it. I think it's why a lot of people love cons. There's a sort of radical freedom. Yeah. Cons, where everyone is free to just let your freak flag fly and nobody gives a crap, you know? Nobody cares. And there's, it's it's liberating, you know? It's yeah. really, I, I, I miss it. I really do miss it. And, you know, I hope that uh, maybe this time next year, you know? Yeah, hopefully. Hopefully, hopefully you know? I am a knock on wood. So the show has affected so many people. Why do you think it's so great and it is so meaningful to that many people? Well, first of all, I think the characters, I mean, it was just the way it's written and animated. I mean, the arc, especially Zuko's character arc. I, I know that Aang is, Aang is the title character, but I, I would actually venture to say that it's Zuko's show. Because the Zuko you meet in episode one is not the same Zuko that we meet at the end of the show. I mean, everyone goes on a journey, and I think I think a lot of it it's just so well written, and it's the characters are so relatable. You know, everyone I, honestly, everybody wants everybody wants everyone and to, to the lesser extent, everybody's felt like Zuko here. And, you know, yeah. everyone wants an Iro, somebody like that. I think everyone can simply relate. These characters, there's a universality to these characters that I think uh, uh, strikes a chord with people, and still and still does. Yeah. And I, th I think it will continue to do so. I, I told my wife not long ago, and I realized, wow, this is, this is kind of amazing. When I realized that long after I am dead and gone, I believe people will still be hearing my voice in season three of Avatar: The Last Airbender. I mean, it's, they're timeless characters, and I. It's, it's, I am, I am continually, I still have to occasionally pinch myself to even think that I'm a part of this. It's, and it all happened to me fairly late in life. I always tell people, oh, you know, I, I want to be a voice actor. How do I do it? And, and the first thing I would say is, you know, uh, persevere. Don't give up. I was 46 years old before I had any real success at it, you know. So, but I didn't go home. I didn't turn tail and, and go home. And there were lots of times when I felt like it. Just keep on keeping on, man. And eventually, I think I think there's a lot a lot to that, to simply sticking to it. Yeah, never give up. And, and I think also because it did happen to me so much later in life, I think I probably have a, a greater appreciation of this wonderful thing that's happened to me. Yeah. You know, that I get to meet people. I get to meet, go places and meet people, and they treat me like I'm a celebrity, which I think is hilarious because I have... I don't think of myself as a celebrity. I'm just, you know, Greg Baldwin. I was a, I was a paralegal 15 years ago. So, you know, I think not that there's anything wrong with being a paralegal. It made the bill, you know. But uh, yeah, I, I, I am continually just I have to pinch myself that I'm, and not just any animated show, but this one, you know, this, this one is going to stand the test of time. I, I, I am convinced of it. What's your favorite episode of the show? I would have to say, I, I would probably say Tales, Tales of Bossing Say. I think that's, a lot of people would say the same thing. I mean, the, the Mako, the Iro scenes are just so remarkable. And when he sings the song, which I will not sing, I still don't sing. People on Cameo say, will you sing it? I want to be clear, I will not ever sing it. The Little Soldier Boy one? Yeah, they always, and I, I will not sing it. It's his song. It is the very least I can do to respect the memory of a man that's given me so much, you know. And plus, I couldn't do it as well as he did. And I couldn't even come close, you know. Trust me, you don't want to hear me sing it. You want to hear him sing it. So then, you also played um, Iroh and Cora. It's coming to Netflix on August 14th, which is yeah, this is. coming Friday. Um, what was it like finding out that Iroh was going to be in the show? I mean, do they call you? Um, how did Wait, you find out? 
I think, yeah, I think my manager called me up and said, oh, they're bringing back Iroh. I think it was as simple as that. Really? And I thought, wow, that's, I was thinking, all right, an Iroh backstory, because that's what I would like to see. Yeah. Uh, and I was, I was delighted, you know. Any, any chance I get to voice that character, I, I, I you know, it, it's such a rich, and I, I, I said it before, I was watching the, uh, talk about why the show resonates. I was watching the Tom Hanks, Mr. Rogers movie. Mm -hmm. uh, and I remember saying to my wife, you know, I think that's the key. I think that's why Iroh has such an impact. He is literally Mr. Rogers for another generation because his lessons are the same, you know? His lessons are essentially be kind to one another and you are important. You have worth, you matter. And that is very much, that is Iroh the whole time to Zuko. Even when Zuko, you know, he's, you know, my own kids, you know? Yeah. yeah you, you know, sometimes you have to just say, you know what? Even though you are really getting on my nerves and I would like to slap you, you are so much better than this and go and be, the better you that I know you can be, and I think I think that's uh, that's why he resonates. And I told him, yeah, I, I like to tell a joke, you know. When my wife says, "Hey, Greg, take out the trash," you know, I, I voice a beloved father figure for an entire generation. Greg, take out the trash. <laughs> I take out the trash. Yeah. So back to Cora. What was it like jumping back into the character after how many years off? Yeah, uh, it was like an old shoe. I mean, I can, I, I could do that voice. That voice comes almost as uh, naturally to me now as my own voice does. You just got right back into it then. Got, you know, anytime, any anytime I want to find the voice, I literally go back to Pacific Overtures and recite either the beginning or the end. It's interesting because he says the same line slightly differently at the beginning and the end as the reciter. And the beginning of Pacific Overtures is very presentational, and it is Nippon, the floating kingdom. And that's my Aku go to. But at the very end of the show, where it's very bittersweet and sad, he is Nippon, the floating kingdom. So that's how I, to this day, find the voice of either Iro or Aku still coming from Pacific Overtures. Wow, that's crazy after that many years. It's, it's how I find them. All I have to do is say that line and it's like, it clicks in my head. <laughs> this is what you gotta do. This is the Mak Mako. So both shows, especially Avatar The Last Airbender, cover a lot of mature and important themes. Most kids shows don't usually show, such as imperialism, genocide, war. Genocide would be one of them, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So out of all of these themes, what do you think is most impactful in the show? Hmm. You know, I think, especially in the times in which we live, I, I think the arc of the show, the, the political arc of the show, for example, is that even this fascist nation can be better. Yeah. And is better at the end. They have to go through, they literally have to go through the fire. Uh, but they do go through the fire and they come out on the other side of it. And, and I think, you know, there's certainly parallels to what's happening today. You know, yeah. I hope we do. I hope, you know, we will. No, we will come through we the will, other side but, of it. But so I think, I, yeah, I think that's the overarching giant theme. And then there's the tiny little human things, you know, but like the, the Zuko learning, learning who he is, Aang learning who he is. They all learn who they are, and they become better versions of them. Every single one of those characters, with the possible exception of Ozai, is, is, a, is a better person, a better version of themselves at the end than they were at the beginning. Yeah. And I think, I think maybe that also is what, thematically, is what resonates uh, today. So you sort of answered this already, but with Avatar being added to Netflix, it's been introduced to a whole generation of people. Avatar is the most streamed show in the world right now. What are your thoughts on that sort of renaissance that's happening? It's fantastic. <laughs> I love it, you know. Uh, please, order cameos for me. I'm enjoying it very much. Uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's wonderful. And I think also what's happening is the generation that first watched it is, is getting old now, growing up, and they're showing it to their own children. And I think that's one of the things that's happening right now. And I think it'll continue to happen because uh, the show is just that good. 
you know, it's just that good. And social media has opened up so many more opportunities for fans to communicate with each other. Um, what is it like seeing all these fans from all over the world just talking about Avatar again? <laughs> I love it. I love it, you know, and I, I pop in occasionally myself. Sometimes I'll just do a search on Twitter of Iroh to see what people are saying. And it's fun to just literally jump into their thread and go, hello, here I am. How you doing? Thank you for saying that. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a social media. Obviously for me, I have to be on social media. It's good for business. And I love meeting people. I love meeting fans through social media and, and at cons. But oh man, social media is a, it's a cesspool. It is a, a, a hive of scum and villainy, you know? Just, just wading into Twitter sometimes. It's like, oh, I guess I want to take a bath, man. I'm shower. It's terrible. Yeah, so this is exactly what you just talked about. Along with fans connecting with, the, with each other, voice actors such as yourself are now interacting with fans more. I was in a group chat that someone accidentally added you into, and they're like, don't be rude to Iroh, and you were like, don't be rude to Iroh. <laughs> I remember, I, I remember, I remember, because it's fun. It's fun just to, again, and that's my joy as an old guy. Like, oh, well, people actually think I'm something. That's so funny. It's I still think it's humorous that, you know, Everyone go, oh, Greg Baldwin's in the chat room. Yeah, Greg Baldwin. I go look at Greg Baldwin, you know? I'm nothing special. You know? Yeah. And then, once again, you mentioned this before, too. I saw a comparison between Mr. Rogers and Iroh. Iroh being this generation's Mr. Rogers. How does it feel holding up this mantle and being this character that so many people look up to in this sort of, sort of like, um, like as a role model? Yeah. It, 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 Iroh even changes me. The, the difference between myself and Fred Rogers is Fred Rogers was that character. The character of Mr. Rogers was Fred Rogers. They were entwined. They were the one and the same. The man was literally a saint. Uh, I am Greg Baldwin. I am not Uncle Iroh, you know? I'm not even the first Uncle Iroh. But the character, because he is a role model and because there are things that he represents, it forces me to be a better human myself as well. In terms of my dealing, I mean, certainly I, you know, circling back to social media, these are, you know, interesting times in which we live. And sometimes I maybe tweet things that I shouldn't have in the spur of the moment. But there are also times when I go, you know, hold on a minute, Greg, hold on. Would Uncle Iroh Tweet that would Uncle Iroh troll that person right now? Is that what he would do? It's it's like the uh, it's like the meme. It's like the uh, uh, what would Uncle Iroh do? Or be be the person Uncle Iroh knows you can be, and that even that's the power of the character. He even speaks to me and says, "You know, oh Greg, you know, don't be an asshole." <laughs> he may be nice. Yeah, unknown to many, Iroh was actually his language was saltier than most people actually know. It's true. It's true. Oh. So what was your favorite bit of wisdom Iroh gave out? Like his favorite proverb or favorite line? The, my favorite one, and again, this is one that I, it means something to me and I, in my own times of life, when I go through, and we're all going through this together right now anyway, you know, but uh, any, any line that Mako ever delivered is five times better than I ever did. But of the lines that I actually delivered was from Korah. And it is the, uh, and I use it a lot in cameos because I love it and I love just saying it because there's so much truth in it. If you look for the light, you can often find it. If you look for the dark, that is all you will ever see. Well, and I love, I love that line because it's, there's so much truth and it's also so simple. It's so simple. Just, just look for the light. Be contented with what you see instead of what you want, I guess. Honestly, I think Iroh, Iroh could be a religion. You literally, you literally could start a religion, you know, of just Iroism. <laughs> I don't know. I joined. <laughs> I don't want to, I would join too. I don't want to be the head of that religion, thank you, no. But I definitely join it. And uh, and again, he says so many wonderful things. And and you know, again, I, I, I'm circling back to the cameos because that's so much of what my life has become lately. And I cannot tell you, I, I, I'm helping people that want Iroh to make them feel better. But by being Iroh, it makes 
me feel better. It's a comfort to me as well. And that is just a wonderful thing. Not only that, but I get to, you know, there aren't many places to act these days. I get to play Iroh every single day now. Yeah. Really every single day. And uh, yeah, it's, it's remarkable. It is remarkable. I am blessed would be the appropriate word. Yeah. Do you have any, um, wrapping it up soon, I don't want to take too much of your time, um, but what is your favorite memory since becoming Iro? Do you have any great, like a great story or? Well, I mean, I, I would have to say, I, I can't really single out one fan because I lo they're all so wonderful. My greatest memory is going to these cons and getting to talk to these fans and hear their stories about how the show changed them. That of all of all the things that I've done or ever will do, again, that's why this character is so important. He matters to people and he still matters. And to be just a, a tiny part of that is, that's my favorite memory. And then there are many memories, many, many fans that came up to me and, you know, and even now fans with the cameos, even now, you know, social on social media, all over the place, you know, it's, that is my favorite. My favorite part about it is, is meeting these fans and talking to them either through the internet or in person. Yeah. So is there any last words or anything you'd like to say to, to the people watching for we end it all? Not end it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. <laughs> Before we end the call. <laughs> you know, I would say, as I say, these are, these are dark times that we certainly live in and the troubled times. But I would say to anyone listening and also say it to myself as a way of reassuring myself that uh, many things that seem threatening in the dark become welcoming once we shine light upon them. And so that's, that's what I wish for the fans, for myself, for this tired and weary world of ours. We need more light in our life. There is light and peace inside of you. Let it out and change the world. That's what I would leave you all with. Well, thank you so much. It's I'd like to thank you again for doing this interview, helping me out a lot. Um, I know a lot of people are going to enjoy this. Um, you guys can check out Greg Baldwin. He's on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And be sure to check out his cameo. He does um, the cameos. Oh, and I'm doing cameo zooms now. We haven't done any yet, but I think it'd be, I think, yeah, you, you and up to four friends can, can have a Zoom, meet, Zoom wow. combo with me, you know. Wow, that's it's, cool. It is cool. Yeah. Technology, as horrible as this pandemic has been, we are learning to connect with each other in ways that we never dreamed possible before. Again, looking for the light. I'm looking for the light, you know. I feel like in a way, almost because of our phone and social media, we're like more messaging and texting and stuff, but because of the pandemic and Zoom, we're finally being able to see each other's faces again. Faces again, exactly, you know, and it's, it is, we will get through this, you know. Yeah. I, I am optimistic that, you know, this time next year, I will be meeting you again in person, you know. Come and share a cup of tea with me. In fact, there was a guy at one con who literally brought tea with me. And I was so excited. I said, oh, this is tea. Oh, wonderful. And it was really delicious tea. And it was my handler who was like, you know, I'm just saying, Greg, that's a really good way to poison a voice actor. You know, maybe you know, never even occurred to me. Who would want to poison Uncle Iro? Zula. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Azula. Definitely Azula. Azula. He's crazy and needs to go down. Well, one, one last thank you to you. Um, you. I appreciate you giving up some time to talk to me. Um, and I hope in the future you stay safe and healthy. And Same, my friend. Thank you. And I look forward to hearing many more Iro impressions. Hey, you and know what? I'll come and meet me at a con, remind me of this interview, and, you know, free picture for you, my friend. Thank you. No charge for the selfie in picture. Please. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.